Uh, what I was, uh, I was just red flagged, it was random. I, I heard that's what the officer said, that I was just randomly red flagged and something came up and they took me to the, I guess to the back room and they questioned me. But for about six hours, nobody could really tell me why I was detained. They, they just, they, nobody could explain to me what, why I was there. And I would ask questions of why I was there, but they, nobody seemed to know the answer. So eventually a shift change came and uh, finally somebody decided to look into it. Uh, and the officer at the Miami airport told me that they really hadn't done anything in the back. They really, they just kind of pulled my record and left it sitting there. So really nobody was doing anything for six hours. Um, and it took another six or seven hours for them to get really, at the time they didn't find enough, I guess what they said, proof to hold me uh, in Miami. So they um, sent me like, what it's called a deferred, uh, call it a deferred uh, inspection a deferred inspection which they took my uh, residency card away and then they they set me an appointment an appointment right then and there to be uh, to come to well they let me come back to Houston and they sent me an appointment to go pick up my uh, my permanent resident uh, card and uh, when I picked it up um, before all this it was it was a month in between between them when it happened when I was detained at the airport and then when I actually was detained in Houston um, so when I came in, in that time, I did research and I asked to see if it was just going to be, if I needed a lawyer or what it, what, I, what it is that I needed. So, uh, I took the precautions of taking a lawyer and put in a package, uh, of everything explaining why everything that I've done in the past is not really anything involving moral turpitude. And so only, I mean, it didn't do anything because when we showed up to the office, the lawyer was not allowed to go uh, speak for me, and she was also not allowed to go to the back of, uh, to go to the office with me. Also, in the press release, you said that there was an alleged felony conviction from five years previous. Yes. Tell me about that. So, uh, in 2010, uh, my wife and I, at the time she was my girlfriend, we lived in Midtown, and uh, we were coming home from jogging. Uh, long story short, a gentleman approached us. Uh, and well, it was a gen one gentleman at first, and then um, for some reason, he just got really belligerent because we were trying to turn into our apartment complex, and he was blocking the entrance. Uh, so after, you know, just me sing signaling to the gentleman that I was just gonna turn right, he just got out of the car and started hitting the hood of my car. Um, another gentleman came out shortly after. Uh, she played softball at the time. So, um, long story short, uh, a, a bat was involved, and I take full full responsibility. And I, once I, I heard her scream because I thought the ordeal was over. He went to her window and kind of hit the car so hard and broke the mirror. And she screamed, and I don't remember anything else. In all honesty, I just picked up the bat, and you know, it's not like. And a, and, and he basically, you know, picked up the bat to say, "Hey guys, is this what you want?" Like, kind of in defense to push him off because he thought they would back off. And the guy charged at him, and in response, he made contact, but immediately stopped. So I was terrified at the moment. So I told David, let's get out of here. We live here. You have a pretty a distinct car. They know it's your car. We're not going to hide from anybody. Let's just come back when things cool off. And when we showed up 10 minutes later, we saw the cops. We felt safe. I said, oh, we're safe now. The cops are here. Let's go You know, tell them. We were the ones that were being, you know, and we showed up, nobody asked questions, they arrested him and charged him uh, with a felony for assault. What were you convicted of that? I was no. never convicted. No, I was assault, I was convicted of assault by bodily injury, which is a misdemeanor. You were convicted of what? Assault by bodily injury, which is a misdemeanor, not, not a felony, and so they served me the NTA through immigration for assault, but with, uh, assault uh, with a deadly weapon, which is a felony. Right. Well, I was never convicted. What was it like for 30 days or however many seconds, however many exact number of days you spent in, uh, up by the airport? I mean, what was that like for you? What went through your mind? Uh, really, in the beginning, you think it's like a fast ordeal because uh, you don't really understand like what laws you know they have or anything like that. But very quickly, you realize that it's it's a lot longer than going into county jail for a DWI or something minor like that, uh, or you know a traffic violation. It's not like you're just gonna 
go in one day and get out the other. And uh, for the very first 30 days, of any, if anything, it was really long because um, they don't give you court day, they don't say anything, so it's really the uncertainty of like being, you don't know what's gonna happen to you. They don't tell you if you're gonna have court or if you're not gonna have court. And so you're calling this hotline number that they give you and uh, you just call every day, but the days go by, you don't get court. I didn't get court until about three weeks of me being in there. And then they they gave me the court day a month after, so. Uh, so how many instances, you know, I assume you come, you come to America, you work hard, you have a car, I think America is a great country. You know, we come with the illusion of making something better of yourself, for sure. Um, I don't think it's much, uh, much America that's a part of it. It's us, like the residents and the citizens of America, that make this kind of a difficult place to be. Um, like I said, there, this is not a bashing contest. This is not about bashing anybody. Or this is just about trying to bring awareness to the ordeal. That's all we're trying to do here. And and help push our our, our local politicians to not allow this these policies that allow people to be incarcerated for long periods of time when they can win the case from the outside. And that was something that was very painful to go through, very costly, um, because this case was winnable from, from day one. We, we, we knew that, but you're not allowed to have a bond because you're considered an arriving alien. And if you fall on certain criteria, it's just really what bracket you come under. And you're not, you don't, you're not eligible to have a bond, so you get this. And so the policies make it really hard to fight it from the outside when you're in. And that's what we would like to where, bring awareness and help bring, uh, you know, our politicians' awareness that these little clauses keep people detained, and we need to, you know, help our politicians understand those things because they're dealing with so many things, and we have to help guide and say, hey, these things need to be changed uh, to make more sense and spend our tax dollars better. And, and can, you you yeah, yeah, can you tell us what it was like when you were actually inside? Were you, were you scared? Were you nervous? What um, was the worst case scenario for you in your head? Um, I, it's not necessarily scary. It's just that you just kind of like, well, you're kind of in limbo in all honesty um, because you don't know if you're like in prison or if you're like in, in a holding facility. Nobody really explains to you what it is. Very quickly, you realize that it's it's not just land people, or it's also, I mean, Africans from all over uh, Africa, Eastern European people, European people in general, Asian people. It's people from from all over the country. I mean, the the world, not just land people. And so, you kind of end up bonding with people either way, you know, because everybody has the same situation. So you're I'm not necessarily scared, but you kind of. Be worried. You become worried for other people because they're going through some some of the same things. And fortunately, my wife and I were kind of prepared to take a hit like this. But I mean, it's really hard. I mean, I would imagine other people were scared, you know, uh, because it's a lot of people that are really uneducated. They're from all over the world. They don't have the proper resources to even communicate properly. So I guess for them, it'd be scared. You know, I, I'd be scared uh, and, if I was them. And for us, we felt we felt a little more confident. I mean, obviously, it was it was an ugly state to be in, but we didn't feel the strain as much because we knew that we had um, the means to help ourselves. So we had some confidence in knowing that we're going to weave our way out of this situation. But I know that a lot of people in there and their families don't have the same opportunity. So what steps are you taking now? Because this seems like a really unfair situation that you were in. I mean, what did you have to do to get out of that situation? Well, first of all, I had to get a hire a great lawyer and uh, you know try to really educate yourself uh, on what it is. Inside, there's ways that you can educate yourself. There's a library that you can read about what, you know, everybody's case is different, entirely different. No, no case in there is really almost the same. It's very few far and in between. Um, what we do now, what, you know, now is, you know, bring awareness to our community, really. But uh, something that really, like, bothers me is that a lot of people are not, they don't really understand what it's like to find, like, a good lawyer. You know, it's, it's very few people that really 
know how to look for a lawyer and I'm not saying there's like a guide or anything, but at least do your research at home before you. Well, should this have happened to you? I mean, what, are, what is your argument against? Well, I, I, I agree with, with the United States doing their due diligence of reviewing cases. I do. We're, we're totally with that. We're not okay with not having the op opportunity to be bonded while it gets reviewed, while you're in there month after month after month after month, and nothing's happening. Now we live here, we have a home, we have a life here. So he was he was considered basically an arriving alien with nothing. And if you have something to prove that you have an entire life here, you shouldn't be detained the entire time, unless you're dangerous. So that to us is, we don't feel like, oh, we didn't deserve this. We didn't because everybody has to go through their process. It's not fair to hold someone for so long when you know your case is winnable. And it doesn't cost, not only does it cost us a lot of money to go through it, it costs the taxpayers a lot of money. Each detainee, you know, for the references I was looking, it was $200 a day that we're giving these private companies. So, his, his so, in turn, yeah, so in yeah. turn, my stint in this facility was about between fifteen and seventeen thousand dollars, and as a resident of the United States of, of, of here, I mean, I pay taxes, you know. So I feel like I would like my tax money to be spent a little bit more wiser than. And not only that, but really, what what this whole deal is is also a, like presence for profit, you know. This is what the whole ordeal is, and that's something that I don't agree with. Well. What, how, what, how about what I want to call it? You know, really, something happens every day. Mm -hmm. People all across the country, and sure. the battles we're used to fighting is that helicopter. Well, I think one important thing too is that you know David made at least two other trips where he left the country and came back in, and CBP officials were able to look at a screen and say, "Welcome back to the United States," and he had no trouble. This time, coming through Miami, an officer saw the same screen, the same information, nothing had changed, and made the decision, we're going to put you back to secondary questioning. This wasn't by chance. It was someone saw the screen. They saw an assault conviction. Okay? It was a, originally filed as a felony case, but he did not plead to the indictment on that felony case. He pled to a misdemeanor, class A, uh, no family violence, no deadly weapon case. but. Assault can still be considered a crime involving moral turpitude, and being convicted of a crime involving moral turpitude can keep somebody from being a, a, an arriving alien is subject to mandatory detention. So the issue was kind of a very, very tough issue. We had probably the smartest judge in the system, you know, considering this case, and even he was thrown at first about the issue. He, he saw our point that we believe this case never should have been filed in the first place, but he gave the government a chance to respond. They could not provide information that would overcome the judge's concerns that the case shouldn't have been filed. So this wasn't a, a, an, an easy decision. But it just goes to show you how capricious the system is when people can leave and not really know that, uh, you know, if you come back twice and you haven't had problems and you pled the case and had attorneys telling you this should not affect you in the future, you know, you kind of believe that maybe you have a chance. Now, what was also really concerning to me in this case was that, you know, David had a case he was going to win. I mean, you know, I can't guarantee you that, but I've seen enough cases that I know we would have won on the judge's discretion to cancel his removal. So what sense does it make to make somebody sit in custody for that long. Now, the judge didn't have choice on that. If you're an arriving alien in the complete, very complex and complicated world of immigration, a judge can't give you a bond. You have no right to get a bond from the judge. But ICE had every ability to provide him parole release. They do it quite often when somebody has a drug conviction or something else that makes them subject to mandatory detention. Why they didn't in this case is just one of those mysteries. They didn't have to, but they certainly could have. And it would have made every sense because he certainly wasn't a flight risk. But you're right, Maya. I mean, this, these uh, situations like this happen every day. And as I told David, I'll bet if he'd lived in Miami, he probably would have gotten a date to show up for court, but he never would have lost three months of his life sitting in detention, as happened here, as many people end up doing. Are you guys going to be immigration activists now? Um, it's it's a, it's our it's our responsibility as 
because we've always been very involved in our communities. We've always uh, been involved in organizations. We've always had a voice, we just never really had a platform. So it's our responsibility because we know English very well and Spanish very well to at least make people aware of what happened to us because prior to this happening to us, we didn't know that if you had any kind of conviction or any kind of problem, um, that you had to present them at some point to an immigration court. We had no idea. We, like most people think, oh, I got in trouble for, I don't know, getting in a bar fight, right? I did my, I got my misdemeanor, I paid my two days in jail, I paid my fines, it's over, I'm done, right? So what happened to us is he got his green card re, uh, resent to him because it was lost. It came in the mail. We didn't have any problems getting a new card. So we figured, well, I guess there's no real problem because we got a new card issued. There's no problem. And then you cross an airport and then you're arrested and say, you never took care of this. So, and, and you know, and I, as I was digging for information, I was asking, um, I was asking my, you know, I was calling my, my Congresswoman's office. I was calling my state representative. I needed answers because I just didn't have answers. And I got to the point where it's no one's responsibility to tell you that you that your crime is affected affects your immigration status. And now you have to take the next step to clarify that because you're not over. It's not over yet. So that to us was the biggest thing that, that, that we learned that people don't know. And it's not a part of the process to tell, you know, the, the prosecutor doesn't have to tell you, the lawyer doesn't have to tell you, the courts don't have to tell you. So who tells you that you have to go present your cases to the immigration court? It's not so much of activism, it's just so much as bringing awareness to the issue. It's not, it's my responsibility to let my fellow, I mean, residents and immigrants know the repercussions of, you know, a broken immigration system that, you know, innocent people pay. And you, you're right, I'm not the only case. There's hundreds of cases like mine. The difference is that I chose to do something about it and, you know, and speak out about it. That's the only difference. So, thank you. So, there's, uh, just, <coughs> when, when you uh, walked into the airport and everything was okay because you've been there a couple of times, you didn't think anything was going to happen. They stopped you, all the bad things show up and everything like that. What was going through your mind? Um, after they stopped me, my wife was, she was with me at first, and then uh, she she stepped out and they didn't let her back in the room. My main concern was she's going to be out there for God knows how long. She literally left my side after an hour of us being there, and I was detained in the airport for 13 hours. So you can imagine, I was like, I don't know what my wife is. I don't know what she's doing. Is she going to go home? Uh, because the officers uh, encouraged her to take the flight home. Uh, so I didn't know, you can't use your cell phone in there, you can't text, you can't, you can't do anything. So I, I was just concerned for my wife's safety and making sure she was all right. And really, I, I'm, I, it didn't really affect me as much. I mean, I was thinking of what's gonna happen after. I didn't realize this was gonna be you know, the end result.